G'day guys, Jared Powell here, I'm back with another edition of On the Shoulders of Giants, sitting outside today uh, in the beautiful Gold Coast weather. Not bad, 25 degrees in the middle of winter. Anyway, I'll stop, I'll stop gloating and get, and get on with the purpose of today, which is to talk to you about a conversation I've recently had with Abby Tabor. Abby is a physiotherapist, which I found out uh, in real time during the recording, uh, but she has since gone on to have a really prolific career in research and research concerning something that is very topical at the moment in the world of, of pain, actually, and that is this concept of active inference or predictive processing. So we talk about what active inference is, what predictive processing is, and how it's starting to gain momentum in its application to pain. Uh, so the concept of predictive processing is quite dense. It has roots uh, in philosophy and cognitive science, and there's some fairly dense and complicated physics and mathematics and statistics underpinning it, which we don't go into. We look at more the framework of what predictive processing is and how it may have clinical implications for us as physiotherapists, especially in its application to pain. So I won't, won't hold you up for much longer. Uh, I've posted some articles and papers that Abby has published in the description below. So if you want some more information, please go ahead and read those. Cheers, guys. I really hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Abby Tabor. Okay, here we are with Abby Tabor, who I hope I pronounced your last name. I should have, should have checked that before. Uh, who is over in Bristol in the UK. Uh, hi, Abby. Thank you very much for joining me for a conversation about something that is, I think, should be of great interest to physiotherapists. So thank you. Hi, Jared. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be chatting to you. So, yeah, cheers for the invite. No worries. We've all got a lot of time in at the moment with this, <laughs> with this pandemic, which we won't speak too much about. So these Zoom conversations have come in uh, good value for me. So I guess where I want to start is, is uh, who are you? What's, what's your background? We just discussed uh, a moment ago that you were a physio, which I had no idea about. So we, we do have a little bit in common, but you've since progressed into uh, an illustrious research career. So give me a bit about you and your background. Yeah, so um, yeah, as you say, like I, I started off um, working as a physio um, in London, and that does seem like a bit of a, a distant memory um, now, but I, I'm, I sort of went and did a PhD, um, which was very um, sort of, well, it was, it was great for me. I worked with Laura Mosley, Nick Thacker. Um, I spent some time in South Australia. Um, and yeah, that kind of started me on the uh, research route, really. I came back to the UK and, and since then I've, I've kind of been working um, in academia. So I'm currently a lecturer um, in rehabilitation at the University of Bath. Um, I'm living in Bristol. Um, and yeah, my work is really trying to look at particularly sort of theoretical models and how they apply to understanding the transition from acute experience to a persistent one. Um, and yeah, basically trying to get a grip on, on how we understand those, those potential mechanisms from a theoretical perspective. So why did you, why did you move from a promising physiotherapy career to a career in research? Did you have a, an existential crisis or, or what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably something like that. Um, I think um, I, I probably can blame Lorimer for that, actually. Um, I, I was a slightly disillusioned physio when I went to listen to him talk at Queen Mary's University, and, and that was a bit of a, a game changer to me. It sort of opened up the idea of, of, of what it was to be a physio um, and, and how you could be a physio and ask questions and how those questions can lead to, you know, a deep, dark world of research. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I blame Lorimer. <laughs> I think he's I think he's guilty for a number of uh, career shifts there um, what do you mean physios can ask questions we can't ask questions we just have to stick with tradition and dogma and do it just because of the way it's been done right that's what that's what orthopedic <laughs> surgeons do <laughs> no, just um, but no you're right isn't isn't it isn't it good now where the, the concept of evidence-based practice and evidence-based medicine which which is funny it's been around for obviously decades um, but I feel like it's really taken off over the last 
uh, 10 to 15 years, probably with the advent, I, th I think social media has been powerful here in actually disseminating a lot of this stuff and obviously the internet and blah, 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 blah. But I, I really feel like the physio is at a, at a juncture, at a really sort of critical point where we're all starting to ask questions and, and often, and I'm, I'm involved in, uh, in teaching at university as well, and we're still, I'm not going to say too much, but we, we still teach things that perhaps may have been updated a little bit, you know, over time. And, and I, I sort of struggle with that. There's a bit of a tension in between how much do you actually teach to students in terms of how much uncertainty do you give them? Because a lot of stuff is uncertain. Or do you just say, I'll oh, do this special test for the shoulder and that will reveal a pathoanatomic diagnosis, you know? So there's kind of that pull between, okay, we need to ask questions, but, but when do you ask them and at what point in your career or do you just give it a couple of years after you practice for a bit? I don't know, obviously you teach as well. What do you, what do you think there? Because we do have to sort of have some sort of answers for students, don't we? Yeah, I, it, it's, an, it's an uncomfortable yeah. rub, I guess, of having a, sort of, a certain amount of, of definite that enables students and practitioners to have a, um, a platform from, from which to practice. And, and I think that is important. Um, I think it's, you know, in some of the teaching that I'm involved with is within a master's physiotherapy program. And a lot of that onus is, is on how, how do we feel comfortable with that? discomfort of of mm -hmm. like actually our practice isn't it doesn't have to be pinned to a certain to a certain flag and actually more the skill is not necessarily in the the or wholly in the technique but but in in the way that we apply that and the questions that we ask of of, of ourselves as we apply our techniques um and remaining open that there are multiple ways to achieve different outcomes absolutely so Exactly. This is, and this is something that uh, I've just submitted a, a paper on. It's the mechanisms of an intervention aren't probably what you think they're doing. So if you apply a strengthening exercise to the shoulder or to the quadricep, whatever you want, that person's pain can become ameliorated even if their strength doesn't increase. So what's the mechanism underlying applying resistant you know what i mean so there's this multifactorial interaction between how we think something works and how it does work yeah i think that's the reality that we face in in healthcare though when you're when you're dealing with people these complex entities in an even more complex world then your intervention is is just a small part of a, a much bigger picture and it has the ability to spawn so many different interactions that can have positive and negative effects um mm. and and i think being open to the idea that that, that is, is the case um, mm. is yet part of the but this, but. The important thing is, I think, is that we're not, we're not, I don't think we're taught enough that, so our clinical reasoning is still embedded in this biomedical model, 100%. And that, that is what I, I believe pretty much every single university course of physiotherapy teaches. And that's why you learn special tests, that's why you learn testing active range of motion with a goniometer you know that's that's the cause of the pain because that's two degrees out versus the other side or a scapular dyskinesis which is my area of interest but and then and then and then a couple of years out we start hearing from Lorimer Mosley or we start hearing from Peter O'Sullivan or other important voices in the field and then we're like well how does that equate with my deeply biomedical understanding of things you know so I do think we can be better at at, at sort of teaching students, hey, this, this is probably not too far wrong. You can, if somebody comes in with shoulder pain and it hurts when they do that and it, it, they're a certain age group and they fell over the day before, algorithmically, statistically speaking, there's a chance that they probably have a rotator cuff tear or something like that. But when we speak about pain or when we speak about uh, other more complex perceptual things, as, as you were saying before, we have to be, we have to think outside of a pure biomedical dualist model. So I imagine, like, how do you go in your, what, how do you go, so in your first person experience, how do you go explaining that to a bright eyed student who wants to know <laughs> what, what a positive test for, for this means for a Hawkins Kennedy, for example, in the shoulder? What do you, what do you say? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll just come back to the, the previous point about sort of teaching within physio school. Mm. I, th I think like I was in some ways lucky to have um, uh, an education in, in physio that was, as you described, largely biomedical. But in midway through that, we had this sort of this guy come in and talk about this what, what seemed to us as just completely radical and off the wall and that guy was Mick Thacker and he kind of just introduced this whole sort of different world of understanding what pain constitutes um, and it was completely at odds with most of the the rest of the teaching and it kind of stuck with me that we'd had and, and, and then going into practice after that you're dealing with patients that that their number one sort of concern is there is there pain often um, and we had two lectures throughout the entirety of my undergraduate degree that focused on understanding what pain actually was um, and we spent whole semesters understanding manual handling of, of the of the shoulder so it's kind of that well, how, how do we how do we reconcile that um, and I think you know the, the question you ask is, is a poignant one it's one that I'm, I'm trying to address within the way that we structure our course actually rather than sort of maybe at the individual level and, and I'm trying to structure the way in which our units are outlined so this is maybe a bit a bit boring and, and not so practical on a one-to-one -one level but the, the idea that we can approach problems whether they are traditionally bio, biomedical and your example there is or well, this is kind of like a clear-cut um, by biomedical model it works for that um, but I guess part of what we're trying to do is you know we do have models that still accommodate the idea that there is a sort of a, a driving factor that is not wholly um, sort of at the at the psychological level or the social level and, and, and really integrating the idea that we can accommodate wholly sort of injury based um, experiences of pain in the same model as as, as as pain experience that seems wholly detached from from injury so I think it's it's trying to um, approach it from a framework that gives us gives us that leverage rather than having to jump between uh, uh, like this this biomedical model to biopsychosocial how, how, how do we reconcile the two uh, un, under a model that get, that gives us um, strength as a pra practitioner yeah yeah, and we're going to we're going to get to what that what that model might be in a moment. But before we get into the to the nitty gritty of it all, I have to ask you a ridiculous question: What book are you reading at the moment, and or what TV series are you watching? <laughs> yeah, so well, I, like these these questions, I'm always like I, I see them <laughs> on and I'm like, God, I, I really hope I'm actually reading a book. If I'm ever asked. <laughs> Just flick one open. I am reading a book, although it's, it's something that I've been trying to digest for a long time, and it's um, called Cytopia by um, Carolyn Steele. Um, and it's just, it's, it's completely outside of the work that I do, which is nice to escape, but it's also something that's um, really interesting from a, um, just a, a world perspective, I, I guess. Carolyn Steele's an architect, and she's, she's writing about how food um is really the center of, of everything how we experience the world um from from food chains all the way to our, our social social lives and how that has become wholly detached from how we um get our food so that detachment is is crucial in in socioeconomic divides in people as, as well as our health um, that's still pretty dense stuff though i mean that's uh yes yeah, that's, that's... it doesn't take so long to get through it. i've been reading it for about six months i think <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm guilty of that. I'm reading a book uh, called Behave by Robert Sapolsky at the moment. It's taken me, um, it's 18 months now since I first opened it. And it's, wow. it's 800 pages, so so just don't judge me. But um, man, I'm going to reread every page a number of times. So it's not it's not good night time. Well, actually, it does put me to sleep pretty quickly. Okay, anyway, so so thank you for revealing that. I think that just adds a little bit of you know personality to these somewhat boring conversations. So... Let's get into the, the good stuff, the stuff that I've, I came, I've come across or I've known you for. Um, I've read a lot of your work and it mostly has to do with these terms and I'm going to throw a few terms out there. Active inference, Bayesian inference, predictive processing, the Bayesian brain, blah, 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 blah. Predictive processing stands out because that's, uh, that's something that has really taken off um, in the field of physiotherapy probably only within the last five to ten years. I know it's been around a lot longer in other disciplines, but Mick Thacker is a leading voice in uh, predictive processing at the moment, and I know you've worked with him as well. So 
So could you just sort of briefly describe predictive processing or active inference, if you like, and how the two may relate? And how does it apply to pain specifically? Yeah, so I guess a good starting point, because I think, you know, we're at a point where these terms are, it's a bit like a forest trying to navigate through understanding what these different terms mean and, and how they've been taken in different research directions, actually, and sort of, you know, starting with predictive processing, this, this really is a, um, a framework that, that it has its basis and all of all of these sort of terms that you've you've mentioned whether it's predictive coding um predictive processing sort of active inference are sort of grounded in a sort of statistical inference model um namely bayesian inferences which is essentially trying to describe probability um and and, and how probability relates to um all the way up to e experience um and so this is a bit of a starting point in in my case with with Lorimer when I was trying to describe how the experience of pain in, in some of his work that he'd done previously can can shift given different contexts whether it's um, a different visual piece of information different auditory cue how, how does the experience of pain how is that reshaped given the fact that we have access to more information and the sort of predictive processing um, framework really borrows from other perceptual inferences so largely vision um, and how people make sense of a world that is um, uncertain so the pieces of information that we have access to are uncertain and we try and integrate pieces of information to increase the certainty with which we kind of know what's what's happening um, there's a sort of an important inversion in that process whereby the, those models of, of inference are really about not passively receiving stimuli, but actively seeking in, information in order to make sense or try and make sense of what has caused the sensory piece of information um, to, to sort of be um, in, in, inferred in that way. So it's kind of a, it's a way of, accommodating this element of uncertainty in our experiences our experiences are, are when we when we experience them are, are, are very certain we, we know we're experiencing pain with 100 percent certainty um, what this inference process tries to um, under underline that with is the idea that all perceptual experiences are based on incomplete information and we're doing our best to make sense of that so <clears throat> So this extends to all of our perceptions, this extends to vision, this extends to hearing, this extends to whatever else? Yeah, so we, we, can, we can apply this, this framework and it has been largely applied outside of the world of, of pain where why, by we, we try and understand you know, how, how we basically make sense of a world. Why, why is the world such a certain place for us? in the sense that actually we're, we're constantly dealing with information that isn't isn't complete about the world we we kind of we have to almost fill in the blanks with with information from different sources in order to have that that, that sort of coherent idea of what our body is uh, and what our what our world is yeah and that's uh, the, the what what are sort of the vision is the one that that is interesting to me because how the hell do we formulate vision based on photons hitting our retina, you know, or how, how, how do we formulate sounds, distinct sounds that we know out of, you know, vibrations in your, in your ear. It's, it's a crazy thing to think about, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that, that process, you know, in, in historically it's been considered sort of, in a, in a modular way where you kind of have this transfer of information in, 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 in separate um, sort of um, vessels so that they're kept separate. But what we know more about our experience is that they're wholly multi-sensory and we integrate information to have a better idea about what, what's go, going on. Mm. And so how does, and how do we then apply this to pain specifically or how, so firstly, how do you think about pain? What's your, What's your TED talk on pain? And then how does predictive processing uh, become integrated with, or how does it explain pain? 
Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, this is, this is ongoing for me. I think, I think there are no, um, I, I, this is something that I toy with on a, on a daily basis, trying to kind of adequately um, either de define pain or, or understand pain from, a, from this framework. I think it's an ongoing process for me. The, the key elements to it, I think that, that the framework helped draw out, and really this is appealing more to active inference than um, sort of predictive processing in many ways, um, is that there is a blurring of the boundary between perception and action under these, these frameworks. They, they essentially work together in order to attempt to resolve discrepancies that we might encounter. Um, and from that perspective, if I come back to, to pain, the experience of pain sort of sits between, uh, sort of between this boundary of perception and action. And I like to think about it as something that is something that we do um, in, in a, a process that, that aims to protect ourself from future harm. And I think those two things are really important that come out of the, this, this predictive framework. One, that we have something that is not wholly perceptual or wholly an, an output of the current state of affairs, but rather something that is um, orientated um, to, towards the future so that we are attempting to protect ourselves from future harm rather than the current state. Um, the current state informs it, um, but we're protecting from, from current harm. And, and, and that really is about action in the future. Um, so pain is a sort of um, wholly tied to this action um, within, within the future realm. Yeah, so, so pain is... Pain is, it's not just something that happens to us. It's not a bottom up experience. It's not, perhaps it's not a passive experience. It's something that's sort of embedded within action and, and prompts us to perhaps do something um, or safety seeking behavior or to stop that happening again in the future. Is that, is that the crux of what you're trying to say? Yeah, I think probably summarised better than than I did. This this idea that that pain is something that we we do we experience in order to prevent future harm. This sort of like this this change in action in order to maintain or, or, or resolve bodily integrity. Yeah, awesome. So that yeah, has a lot of sort of implications for physiotherapy practice. I think where. We, that's how we need to conceptualize pain and we need to sort of understand why someone who has a sore knee doesn't want to do a squat, you know, because at the very granular level that is going against what their system is telling them to do. Right. So we need to come at it from a, from a different sort of way. And then we also need to not further sensitize that fear perhaps of, you can't squat below 90 degrees, otherwise you're going to squash your meniscus and you're going to tear it, you know? So, that, so I think for having an understanding of pain in that manner really will directly inform our practice, even just based, based on that definition without even going any further into it. So thank you. That's, that's a really cool way of thinking about it. Um, go on. No, no, just, yeah. It's a, I, the idea of that definition is, is trying to be helpful, something that, that, that is evolving in in my mind and and yeah like like you say trying to um team that with with the way that we think about pain and, and shifting that in terms of actually if someone's inferring that the situation that they're put in is th threatening then their interpretation of that situation situation is going to be very different to somebody who who isn't um yeah 100 so yeah. and that will that will sort of dictate the progression of their symptoms and how we need to interact with them as well. So this is the individual individuality of pain, right? And I think we're going to speak about this a bit later on where pain can get stuck in some, to, again, to, to borrow one of your terms. So if we just sort of linger with uh, predictive processing uh, for a little bit longer, what's, so what are the constituent components of predictive processing? What's a prediction error? What happens when a prediction error arises? Uh, what are the, what's the what's the nuts and bolts of it? Yeah, so I guess of breaking it breaking it down, predictive processing is 
uh, constitutes this, this idea that we generate predictions of um, the consequences of our actions. So it might be proprioceptive predictions in terms of where our body is in space um, or where it will be in space if we conduct a particular action like reaching for a cup. Um, it, it also constitutes predictions about the, sen the other sensations associated with that so the visual input of where our arm will be um the tactile sensations associated with with the reach those sorts of things so we sort of have these these predictions about how our body will behave when we act um, the prediction error that you talk about in predictive processing is, is sort of the discrepancy between those predictions that we we hold and what actually occurs um, and so you have this sort of feedback in, in, the, in the sense that when you do reach for the cup there are, there are pieces of information that indicate where your arm is in space and the prediction error is basically the discrepancy between what you predicted and where where the arm is as it as it reaches um, and you're constantly sort of up, updating um, that the process of, of in predictive processing is that you're constantly updating um, that prediction potentially on one side so say that the, the the cup is moved or your arm is jogged you're updating where the arm is in space and, and reconciling that prediction error so the, the 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 information that's coming from bottom up is 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 more um matched to the predictions the other side of um the, the sort of coin if you like um in reconciling prediction error is is altering your action so it could be that you you change the way that you act in order to meet the expectations of your your prediction so it's sort of two different ways in which prediction error is is resolved and the idea under predictive processing is that your aim is to minimize prediction error in order to pursue sort of long-term um, coherent behavior in an environment so you become better essentially at predicting how you will um, interact with your environment and that the, the reduction in, in, in prediction error or in, in active inference long-term um, surprise or free energy. Yeah yeah the interesting that you mentioned free energy right at the end there I was just listening to something um, by Carl Friston and I'm going to have to listen to that about a million times. But anyway, so um, if we talk, so if I just try and encapsulate what you, what you said, so we, we have a prediction or we have a generative model of how we think something is to pan out or, or what are the consequences of our sensations, for example. And then we're constantly comparing that to sensory information or, or sort of bottom-up information that we're constantly receiving. So as you said, proprioceptive, interoceptive, and extraoceptive is that is yeah that that's it and i guess the other point is that this this happens across a sort of a, a neural hierarchy if you will so it could be that, that these are very quickly resolved in terms of you know reflex action so the, the, the mm -hmm. spinal cord level it could be that it, it's propagated higher up the hierarchy where these prediction errors are having to be resolved with more high high level um sort of scheme so updating the predictions of, of how our body moves and this is something that's an ongoing learning process um, and it happens as we learn a new skill um, just it happens as, as we injure ourselves and have to better accommodate what what the body is is capable of um, so all of these all of these prediction errors they don't just to clear this up for everyone they, they don't reach consciousness do they you haven't got so a prediction error is a, is, a, is a is a term that essentially describes how in information is passed within the nervous system. It's not something that you would consciously be aware of. Um, it's something that's that's part of um, a framework that helps to describe how information may or may not be passed through um, our, our system, essentially. Yeah. Cool. So. Okay, so I think that explains a, a prediction error. And then there's two ways that we can actually reconcile perhaps a prediction error. We can either update our model or we can act on the environment to change the, the sensation or the, the stimulus. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's it. So you've got sort of two sides of the same coin where you're going, yep, do I, um, do I need to update my model of, of how my body behaves in a certain context? 
um, and, and, and that constitutes learning? Um, or do I change my behavior to better reflect my prediction within this environment? And you could, could give an example of sort of walking down a cobbled street at night where your your behavior usually walking down that street would be to just power on through and get get home but given that the low light and there are co cobbles you're having to update your behavior in order in order to better navigate um, uh, an environment that's giving you lots of other sensory inf information um yeah. so a crude example i guess it's worth mentioning at this point that, that a key element of that is um, a part of the framework is, is known as precision weighting. Uh, and this concept of precision weighting is, is crucial to understanding how information is passed through the hierarchy um, and how it is used to update certain, to update the generative model and, and, and the predictions that we then make go in, in the future. Um, and that sort of precision it can be talked about to be assigned to information um and that may be information that, that is particularly salient in a particular environment um so given the example of walking down a dark street suddenly vision which is usually relatively pre precise and, and and therefore carries um a good deal of weight through the hierarchy um becomes less reliable and so your system tries to adjust for that increasing the precision associated with say the proprioceptive information of the ankle joint for example so, so you're knowing where your body is in in space and that's informing um perhaps greater and, and, and yeah that's just just one example yeah no that's the the concept of precision i think we're going to get to uh, a little bit as well when it applies to to pain and so how some signals or some information reaching the brain can be given additional weighting over other competing uh, stimuli either in the environment or in the in the body itself maybe this is a good time to touch on that so so what what what's the what's the relationship between precision of a signal and perhaps the development of persistent pain or a persistent pain presentation what what relevance does a precision of a signal have there and how may that actually impact a physiotherapist's clinical practice okay so <laughs> those are two pretty relatively um whoppers of, of questions but i'll, I'll try and so the, the first bit of that talking about how precision might um lead to um persistence and a, a sort of stickiness um, in experience and and you say that you borrow my term and I'm borrow, borrowing Chris Eccleston actually so he, he's thanks for that but, but um, the, the idea that we have this precision in order to sort of attune to relevant information so in, information is not just sort of um, received or, or sought in, in equal measure we, we are able to attune given the different environment so that most relevant information is is given greater gain and this is a wholly adaptive process and it allows us to be very efficient in our environment taking information that matters to us most in line with our desires and goals and using it to drive and 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 um, help co coherent behavior um, what what I'm proposing or what we're proposing under the sort of predictive processing or active inference framework is that this, this sort of model and the, and the way that we navigate the world in this way, whilst adaptive and efficient, can, can be somewhat, um, uh, <laughs> it can be a little bit vulnerable when it comes to particular interactions that, that happen either very very serious interactions or repetitive interactions in in your life and i guess what this speaks to is um having a prediction that your body is under threat for example so this might be a sort of the integrity of your body threatened through injury it might be threat within the external environment um it drives defensive behavior and that is part of an adaptive process that enables us to either recover or avoid that threat um, however this is a very salient position to be in we, we want to ensure that we don't venture out when we are potentially threatened so we hold this position 
and something that we were talking about beforehand is that there is this trade-off then as to when we start exploring again and for most people this is quite a sort of intuitive process of okay say that I've perhaps rolled on my ankle and my initial reaction is to withdraw my foot and sort of hop around for a little bit and ensuring that I'm not creating future damage by weight bearing on it um, and then gradually over time we'll start wiggling our ankle and start to get exploring the concept of well what's going on in my body and how does that react to the world um, but as you say in, in some people that sort of high, highly precise prediction of, of sort of threat or loss of bodily integrity doesn't seem to um, kind of it's never overridden um, and potentially becomes stuck um, and the sort of difficulty in that situation is that we have a system that's highly adaptive to um, to allow that to continue um, it almost enters this vicious cycle of if we're predicting that um, potentially there's a threat to our bodily integrity we are more likely to seek information that kind of confirms that or assign precision to information that potentially confirms that so we are caught within this cycle of reinforcing the prediction because we have access to information that, that might um, confirm and we are also down regulating information that might serve to override or alter that prediction. Um, in those precision terms we're assigning high precision to information that's relevant to potential threat whether that be seeing a staircase ahead of us and that's something that we're going to have to climb with an ankle that we feel is, is not um, able to um, accommodate that. Um, it might be the proprioceptive information associated, associated with where the ankle is in space. It might be ongoing nociceptive cues that tell us about the, the, the ankle as well. So all of these sort of multi-sensory cues um, are being assigned highly precise, um, or is, is assigned high precision um, and informing our prediction of threat and continuing that prediction, um, rather than opening up and broadening our idea of, of what's constituting what, what the ankle is doing and what our body's doing and more broadly what the environment's doing, we're sort of ignoring or down-regulating that, that sort of other multi-sensory information. Great, great job. So... Sorry, that, was, um, that was slight... <laughs> I'll, try and, I'll try and digest that. So... So the, the thing that really stood out there for me was this decoupling of the experience of pain and perhaps the sensory input or in, in, if we're going to talk about pain, nociception. Um, so this, this, this prediction or this hypothesis or this model of pain can, can persist and that becomes, can become quite removed from the actual nociceptive information perhaps which it may or may not even be experiencing. It may, it may still be a little bit of nociceptive activity but it's not certainly it shouldn't that that that, sh that relationship seems quite disparate so yeah so that that is because of uh, this precision um, aspect where perhaps that person for whatever reason and there might be some psychological factors at play there or some socio-cultural factors as well uh, gives high precision input from only the aspects of their system that confirm their prediction to minimize their prediction error is this is that at all? That's, that's a really good point. I think um, you know to, to broaden this idea that we we not only have this capacity to detach from this sort of stimulus res response notion of of experience within this model, but also to broaden it to this this concept of okay, what have previously been considered highly psychological factors such as anxiety and catastrophizing, how that plays a role in in the underlying physiology of of um, the, the body, whether in injury or not in injury, um, and the broader sociocultural aspects of the sort of the context of our experiences of pain, and that can speak to our, our sort of individual history as well as our evolutionary history over time. Um, and it could be, you know, part of this predictive model um, is informed by the past. And that could be the past of the individual, so particular circumstances that they found themselves in and how that has, has left them, um, as, as well as our evolutionary past in terms of our, our underlying phenotypes, our expectations of, of our experiences. 
and, and what they what purpose they serve um, so it helps to sort of, yeah broaden out the concept of of pain uh, decoupling as you say from this idea of of injury and actually thinking about putting it within a much much bigger context of experience um, that is not just linked to the moment but is um, uniquely informed by the past relevant to the the present and then orientated towards the future yeah that's that's awesome so uh, and i think and we we talked talked about this a moment ago and i think that really encapsulates everything within the biopsychosocial model that we're all trying to practice and apply um, but which mostly gets divided into biological versus psychosocial and i think this is where I'm attracted to predictive processing because I think it within the model itself, you, you almost can't decouple any aspect of that. It's all intrinsically connected to it. So I think yes. this is where predictive processing should have some value and, and utility uh, for physiotherapists. Do, do you agree with that? Yeah, completely. I, I think even, and, and this is something that we discussed as, as well, even at the descriptive level of predictive processing, I think it gives us a, a lot of, um, we mentioned platform before, is this sort of like, like a, a certain element of certainty of, as to how to describe these things fitting together um, without having to um, separate them into their sort of modules um, and then somewhat clumsily um, overlapping them and clunking them back together again. I think from the predictive processing perspective, all of this stuff has evolved together over time. And, and in order to make sense of it, we, we can't separate each aspect and treat each aspect of it as a single entity. Um, it's, it's about trying to use this framework as, as, a, as, a, as a sort of a descriptor that enables us to treat them as um, yeah, completely coupled um, throughout. Yeah. And so I'm going to try and relate this to, to physiotherapy. As, as, as best I can. So if we have a, a sort of real world example, perhaps where um, I'm, I'm going to do the shoulder because that's, that's what this is all about. So if you, if you abduct your shoulder to 90 degrees, that's a painful arc sign that has historically meant subacromial impingement or subacromial bursitis or some sort of rotator cuff pathology is causing pain there. How I'm trying to think about it a little bit is how can predictive processing be applied to that that movement and what i've experimented with a little bit is altering the position so you can do it in sideline position and that that movement may get less probably because you are reducing the load uh, going through the shoulder just with the interaction with gravity and you're changing the context a little bit as well so so the brain may not have a precise uh, model of that particular movement in that position perhaps uh, or you, there's a number of other ways in which you can manipulate any number of internal or external variables to change the, the perception or the experience of pain there. Yeah. So, so that has historically been looked at as that's expectancy violation, right? So that, and that's more in this, um, I don't even know what model, that's kind of within graded exposure, I, I guess where you, ha you try and violate somebody's expectations in order to maximize learning. Um, but that's, and I, but I, think, I think predictive processing captures that as well. And this is again why I'm so drawn to it because it, it captures psychosocial elements, biological nociceptive elements, and it also captures this sort of um, graded exposure, expectancy violation kind of model um, thing as well. So, so, this is, so this is where it can have real practical implications. And you can do the same thing for a squat by manipulating any form of variable uh, there in terms of changing your hip angle or your knee angle or, or whatever you want to do. Um, yeah. Do you want to add anything to that? And I think, I think it's really nice to have, have that example to, to ground us with, because I think it, it becomes really easy to become quite abstracted from um, the reality with these frameworks. And often it's a bit of a dense um language to navigate through so yeah i really like that um idea of how predictive processing can kind of absorb some of the things that we um are already practicing as physios um and it it kind of offers um an opportunity to not only link things together but hopefully set it within a, a deeper understanding of, of why that might be successful and i like it in terms of you mentioned earlier about distraction and I think 
in some ways the use of distractions become this sort of um, you know, whether we're doing it within physiotherapy or whether we're doing it sort of experimentally within sort of um, virtual reality and, and, and things like that I think what predictive processing offers is this idea that actually distraction isn't necessarily the sort of um, be, all, be all and end all of, of, of what we're trying to create here what we're what we're trying to look at is understanding how when somebody's experiencing pain they tend to narrow the way in which they um, explore the world in order to protect themselves but in so doing they're creating a world that is wholly coupled with with painful experience and part of our role of, of, of physios is trying to introduce um, through action often this idea that we can start to broaden this narrow view and, and this sort of precision associated with with potential threat by providing other pieces of information that help to challenge that um, prediction and yeah this this constitutes the, the sort of psychological realm when we're talking about conducting rehabilitation in, in in people that might be highly anxious in particular circumstances as well as looking at, at changing the position of the body so people can uh, like your example of lying down and, and and doing abduction like can we can we alter where the body is in space in order to provide information that is not um fitting in with the prediction of threat yeah and i think i think that's so that's kind of captured within um something which we all intuitively kind of do which is symptom modification in, in physiotherapy anyway where you find something that's painful you do an intervention and then you kind of reassess it and it's classic in the shoulder with the shoulder symptom modification where if somebody has pain with flexion then you perhaps alter the position of the scapula or you get them to grip something to so put external load which is meant to activate the rotator cuff better and the pain goes away the same thing with various techniques in the back where you try and alter the perception of pain but i think underpinning all of that is this kind of predictive processing and we're not i don't think we're actually fundamentally changing anything at the physical level often when we do that we're just providing some form of different input or different context to change that person's pain experience and i think this is where we often get bogged down in physical therapy and in the biomedical model in general where we think that the intervention we provide is due to solely sort of physical responses or by a lot of responses that we can see and measure you know it's due to increased strength or it's due to um, increased capacity in the tendon or it's due to better movement of the scapula or whatever but underneath all of that we, we have to accept that there's this there's this multi-dimensional nature to it that we're, we're trying to reconcile every millisecond or every every minute of the day yeah i think there's, there's, there's so much in that in the sense that you know we we are uh, we actively seek, seek evidence as, as, as people we're trying we're trying to find out um what's what's going on we're, we're seeking to um confirm our hypotheses often not just as scientists but as, as sort of as people trying to work out what's happening and so providing people with evidence um confirmatory or disconfirmatory is is part of of how we go about our lives but i think you're right in terms of that realization of we we think we are controlling a certain aspect of somebody's care when actually when in actual fact we're we are we're not we're part of that care but we're we're treating a complex entity which is then part of an even more complex entity in in, in the world and our interventions or your interventions are are part of something that could be interpreted wholly differently in different in different individuals um and in different sort of um sociocultural environments um and i think that's the other the other thing that sort of active inference and predictive processing perhaps offer is, is this sort of look at um and bringing in this grounding in evolutionary biology where we um consider experience in the modern day um sort of as, as part of uh an involved being as, as humans, most of our evolution has, has occurred in a completely different environment than we find ourselves in today. And I think sometimes that clash of, of um, the environment that we've essentially created for ourselves 
versus the environment that we adapted to over time means that our processes in order to make sense of experiences often have this fallout of mismatch um, and, and it's very difficult to reconcile even though that adaptive process for most people works really well. What we're also seeing is this a high, like this massive increase in persistent symptoms in people, whether it, whether it be um, related to allergy, whether it be fatigue, pain, um, itch, bodily sensations that seem to persist. Um, and I think that that speaks to the larger picture of where human beings have evolved over a long period of time in an environment that doesn't reflect the environment that we're in now. And we're trying to make sense of that with a system that has been developed over um, a period of time outside of that environment. Um, and that's, that's key. I mean, maybe just taking the pressure off a little bit or, or, or in terms of what is the role of the therapist here? There certainly is a role, but I also see healthcare as something that is much broader than it's currently thought of. You know, where is, where is the healthcare in the design of our streets, the design of our houses, our understanding of how we commute to work, how we work, all of those things that pay into this picture of how our bodies should be acting. And yet, we're then we're treating people that sort of fall out of this system um, and, and then put them back into the system that may be causing the problem in the first place. Um, it, it's, I think it enables us the scope, not only as practitioners to have real practical input at the individual level, but I think it also enables to have this real big question as to how are we, we have the power um, you know more than ever before to have control over our environments the way that we design them and yet are we designing them for good or for bad i think i think that's a a, a sort of relevant question yeah wow okay that's um got real meta there real real quick Abby. I, I need to go and lie down now to to think about all of these things thanks for ruining my sleep tonight um i think actually i, th I think that's a probably a good place to, to end that's there's so much to, to consider, but I think if we wrap up um, the predictive processing element of it, wait, what's the future? What's the future with this? What's, how, what's going on in, in research land that you have access to or that you have your ear on the street to? What's, is, there, is there a lot happening in this space at the moment in, in sort of healthcare uh, or is it sort of still within these cognitive science fields or what's going on? Yes, I think, you know, for, for me, my experience of it at the moment is that it probably is situated predominantly within the cognitive sciences, much influence um, neuroscience philosophy um, and, and making sense of largely speaking in the realm of um, diagnosed clinical conditions, usually at the sort of relatively extreme end of the, the spectrum so things like schizophrenia um, and autism where it's a well a pretty well defined clinical condition I think what what where we find ourselves in in pain is that we have a situation that is an experience that is ubiquitous and something that is part of normal life um, and yet also this this sort of other element of pain that it that is wholly um, destructive and um, impacts people's lives negatively. And I think from a research perspective, uh, I can sort of speak to myself. I think things are moving in this direction within within pain. Um, where we're at, probably at the point at which, and this is some of the work that I'm doing at the moment, hoping to build descriptive models that adequately um, translate to hypotheses. And I'm working on a project at the moment that's doing that in phantom limb pain. Another relatively extreme incident of, of um, pain, but my hope is that we can um, develop a model there that translates um, more broadly across pain experience. Um, in this circumstance, what I'm trying to do is take an example of where pain exists, where action is um, impossible. And, and, and so how does, how does that um, relate to the experience of pain where action is restricted um, and, and, and how that how that breaks down so I think where we're at is is still at the stage of building um, appropriate model models that allow this then to be tested um, so testable predictions in clinical populations um, and that that is moving forward there's, there's work being done um, in, in interoception um, Lisa Fieldman Barrett um, Mika Allen um, leading some of that, Sarah Garfinkel um, and Seth 
all doing work that's really trying to look at how this translates in, bo in bodily experiences using experimental paradigms. So it's, it's getting there. Um, I think it, it's, it's still a work in progress um, and particularly in pain where we have an experience that's both um, every day, but also um, not in, in, in terms of the clinical um, persistence. So, so yeah, to, to me, it's an exciting framework at the descriptive level for clinicians. I think it gets um, more exciting um, as we're, we're researching how that translates um, into underlying biopsychosocial mechanisms. Um, and then feeding that back into clinical um, practice is, is crucial. Well, that's, that's really exciting, actually. Um, I'll, I'll, point to, I'll point people to some of your work. So the, the Pain Unstuck paper, and I'll sort of put this up for people, is a really good paper. This, um, this Bayesian learning one, which I've just been over, Bayesian learning models of pain, a call to action, fantastic paper, and then pain, a uh, statistical account, which you did with um, Lorimo and Mick, is a, is a really cool place, I think, for people to start. Um, but yeah, so I'll sort of, there's obviously a lot of reading to be done. It's sort of hard to kind of, it's hard to encapsulate a lot of the stuff. There is some deep mathematics and physics underpinning all of this as well. But I think it's, if you can understand it from a sort of framework, qualitative perspective, I still think you can use it in your practice and have it underpin your clinical reasoning. Yeah, well, I just want to say thank you. You've been very kind um, to me, so thank you. And I think if there's if there are physios or other clinicians that are interested in learning a bit more, I, th I think it's it's difficult to capture everything in a in a conversation. So if, if there are if there are follow ups to this, then by all, all means get in touch. I think it's a conversation um, worth having in the world of physio. Um, and the more that we talk about it, I, th I think the the greater my understanding as to how this translates clinically um, will be. And I, th I think that's, that's key. Okay, Abby, thank you very much for your time. Cheers. Cheers, Dad. Thanks. Bye.